Me and Monica can do all of the introductions. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, work in my group and in collaboration with Dave Schuster's group um, in multi mode heavy quantum electrodynamics um, and the kinds of many body physics that one can do. Uh, quantum information science uh, that one can study uh, using multiple computers. Okay, um, so the talk is sort of split into to three stories. Um, the first two are about using the modes of the cavity to sort of encode emotional dynamics of a of a particle, uh, and we'll talk about building up those analogies. And then how to use nonlinear emitters to make our particles interact with each other. This is basically how to build up a condensed matter system uh, from the ground up using photons rather than, uh, than atoms. Uh, and then the last little bit of the talk will be using a combination of an optical cavity and a uh, uh, superconducting cavity to uh, perform transduction between uh, millimeter wave and optical wave. Okay, um, so what I'm going to try to do in, in each case is start you off with a, uh, a, a little bit of a list of the takeaway messages if you get stuck, okay, or you get a text message on your phone and you need to zone out for a little bit, uh, whatever, uh, just the story that we're trying to get at broadly, uh, if you're not one of the experts who tries to get through to the very last slide and understand everything in each section. Um, the most important slide, of course, uh, is, the, uh, is the group slide. Uh, what I would say, you can always tell a speaker who is not totally confident on their time management for the talk, because what they do is they put the slide acknowledging the people who did the hard work uh, performing the science at the beginning to make sure that that gets covered. So, uh, you know, we have a, a bunch of teams in the group working on the various aspects of optical materials, microwave materials, uh, transduction, some crazy science with wormholes that I can tell you about afterwards if you're interested. Um, and uh, so some really fun science with some like submarine on waste cavities. Uh, and so uh, in particular, uh, Daniel and Anna are here. Uh, so if you want to hear about this science, I'd really suggest you pull that aside. So uh, with no uh, further ado, let's hop right in um, and try to talk about a little bit exploring the fractional quantum Hall effect uh, with light. Okay, uh, so the basic takeaways here, and we're not going to go too much into the details on this story because this piece is really just about uh, building the Hamiltonian engineering tools. Um, uh, what I'd like to explain is how to make photons in an optical cavity act like massive particles in a harmonic trap, and then how to uh, also generate Lorentz forces on those photons. Okay, so what's the uh, what's the, the picture here? I would like to argue that uh, photons in an optical cavity act like massive harmonically trapped particles. So before you say yes, the box basis is the same as the harmonic oscillator basis, I would ask you to know that that's not the analogy that we're going for here, actually. The analogy here is if I send light into my cavity away from the cavity axis, this is an artist's rendition of a cavity. You see these two beautiful blue mirrors. Um, the idea is that the light will then oscillate back and forth in this transverse plane like a massive harmonically trapped particle. So how can we see this analogy? Well, we could just ray trace the light in the cavity. And we see that the rays move back and forth like these massive harmonically trapped particles. So this is sort of a qualitative intuition that what we're doing is right. And indeed, if you look in this middle plane of the cavity at where the, uh, the ray intersects, you can think of this as like a stroboscopic evolution of a harmonic oscillator. Um, but it turns out that uh, even the sort of more quantum mechanical picture of a harmonic oscillator applies here. Remember that the eigenstates of a quantum harmonic oscillator are Hermite Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. And uh, indeed, the modes of a fabric row cavity are Hermite Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. Okay? And so what this means is if I send my light into the cavity 
off center to the right, I can write that as a superposition of the lowest transverse mode of the cavity and the first excited transverse mode. You see that these two interfere constructively on this side and destructively on the other side. Um, but a little bit later in time, this first excited transverse mode has acquired some phase with respect to the lowest mode, which turns that plus sign into a minus sign. And now the light has moved to the other side of the axis. So this is the sort of wave picture, or if you prefer quantum mechanical picture of why this photon <coughs> in the cavity acts like an S harmonically trapped particle. And to be clear, this is really how, uh, this is the connection between a quantum harmonic oscillator and a classical harmonic oscillator as well. All right, so that's great. You should now think of the light as sort of living everywhere along the cavity axis simultaneously but oscillating back and forth transversely. So the question is, how do we add a magnetic field to the light uh, in this story? And to understand that, I'd like you to think just very briefly about a periscope. Okay, so what's the idea? If I send the light from this tree through this periscope, I get a right side up tree. But what if the top mirror is rotated 90 degrees with respect to the lower mirror? Well, then the tree comes out rotated by 90 degrees. Okay, and it turns out that in between, the rotation between the two mirrors generates a rotation of the tree as it goes through the periscope. And for those of you who have ever seen a World War II submarine movie, this is why you turn the whole periscope in a submarine, and there isn't just a knob that turns the top mirror with respect to the bottom mirror. At least, I actually don't know why. That's my guess as to why. Anyway. Uh, so the idea of our cavity is basically to do that exactly what I've shown. Imagine we've got four mirrors and we twist the thing out of the plane, okay, and keep the mirrors pointed at each other. Uh, and what you should then expect is that this turns the lab frame into a rotating frame, okay? On each round trip through the cavity, you get a little bit of rotation of your image. And we know that when you go into a rotating frame, uh, you get fictitious, normally fictitious forces, this Coriolis force and the centrifugal force on your particle. It turns out here, because the lab frame is the one that's really rotating, those forces are real, okay? So the Coriolis force, omega cross P, looks an awful lot like V cross B, right? Right, because V is proportional to P, right? So this gives us, our Lorentz force on the photon or on the light that we wanted. And this omega squared R is like harmonic anti-confinement, right? And we just said that the curvature of the mirrors traps the light, right? So if we have the right amount of curvature, we can cancel out that, <coughs> okay? And the idea is that then we will be left with lambda levels for light. So I don't wanna go into this too much, but what I'll say is uh, we've actually done this. It works very beautifully. You can look at the modes of the cavity. You get families of degenerate ring modes, which are equivalent to the eigenstates uh, of the lowest Landau level. Works very, very nicely. You can uh, zoom in on this lowest Landau level here and see that we can make the mode degenerate to within a few megahertz, um, which you can then think of in this language of, uh, say, a solid state material, this range of energies here at degeneracy sort of tells you how much disorder there is in your system, how imperfect your lambda level is, because for electrons, say, there's uh, your two-dimensional electron gas isn't quite uniform. Uh, you deposited a little bit too much of something in your heterostructure. Now you would ask me, what's the heterostructure made of? I'm a cold atom person. The head structure is made of atoms. <laughs> a lot of orders of magnitude higher density than I do. But the point is, we can, what, what, what my group focuses on a lot is we see a thing in the lab that, in the language of photons, you would describe as imperfections on your mirrors. How does that map in our model of many body physics of photons in a magnetic field onto something within that model? And is it good, bad, what have you? But what is it? What does it map to? And so, at some level, this is much of the game that we're going to play today. Okay. So we make those states nearly degenerate. Um, we add Rayford EIT 
to make the photons interact with each other. But this isn't really the story for the, today. Uh, needless to say, we've made like little Laughlin molecules or pairs of photons orbiting each other uh, in this kind of a story. It turned out we had too much disorder in this initial model. Uh, and so we actually have a cool new cavity where we've replaced the curved mirrors with curved lenses um, that we can use to correct for aberrations in the cavity because it turns out that aberrations in an imaging system correspond to disorder for electrons in a lambda level, okay? Um, and so moving ahead, we're gonna build waffle uh, states uh, that are bigger than two particles in that story. So uh, that's all I wanted to say uh, on this first piece. The main thing to take away is these Hamiltonian engineering ideas. Uh, and, and if you are interested in the specifics, you can, you can look up the references. Um, the main meat uh, of the talk. Yes. Yes, the main meat of the talk. <clears throat> It would be great if I discovered I actually already talked for an hour and I'm, uh, I see my phone doesn't even know what time it is. That's great. Okay, uh, the main meat of the talk is uh, what, what we're gonna talk about now, which is making materials out of microwave photons and the tools of circuit QED, okay? Uh, and so again here, we're gonna make these microwave photons in an array of transponder qubits act like a, um, a, a lattice of uh, in, in a solid state where the particles, electrons, if you will, can hop from one lattice site to another. And if they're in the same lattice site, they collide with each other. So this is sort of the paradigmatic model of materials in the solid state. And that's what we're gonna explore here. So the first thing we're gonna find is great. We figured out how to make that model. Um, how do we actually prepare an interesting many body state in this system, okay? And so we're gonna to try to answer that question. We're gonna come up with two different answers for ways to do that. Um, and what we'll discover is that in fact, one of them is sort of akin to coupling our material to a simple quantum computer. And so we'll start to do Ramsey type experiments on the many body states and try to figure out what those Ramsey measurements mean from the perspective of the many body physics. And in fact, we're gonna discover that there are a type of compressibility. So uh, let's hop in here. The first thing we need to do, if we wanna have uh, photons in some lattice, act like electrons in the lattice, is we need to figure out how to make a lattice site, right? So a lattice site in a solid can hold an electron in some orbital. Right? So we need an object that can hold a photon. How about an LC circuit? That holds photons, right? <laughs> Looks great. Uh, it's happy to hold photons whose frequency is like, oops, uh, is like one over root LC, the resonant frequency of the circuit. The, uh, the only downside here is it will take as many photons as you want to give it. You put in one photon, it'll take a 4.5 gigahertz photon, very happy. You put in another photon, still happy to take a 4.5 gigahertz photon. Let's think about a solid. A solid is sort of made out of atoms, right? Um, and each of those atoms has some orbital that you can put an electron into. You can't really put too many electrons into that orbital before either the atomic orbital's energies change or you just have interactions between the atoms, right? Or electrons, rather. So we would like this second excitation to have a different energy than the first excitation, right? We don't want to be able to put in another 4.5 gigahertz photon. So in the language of quantum computing or quantum optics, we would say we want the nonlinearity there. So what I'd like to do is take a moment and motivate how one might generate this kind of a nonlinearity. Okay, well, the simplest thing to say um, who has ever made an LC circuit? A couple of you have. Great. Did you ever drive it too hard and see it heat up and its frequency shift? A couple of you have seen that too, right? If you heat this thing up by running too much current through it, the shape of that inductor will change, right? Which will change its inductance. <clears throat> 
and uh, then the frequency will shift. The problem is to get that to happen, you need to send through like 10 to the 10 photons or some, some very large number. And we would like to be able to generate entanglement between individual photons. So we want this to happen for one photon and two photons, not 10 to the five photons versus 10 to the 10 photons. So how do we make that happen? Well, the simplest answer is you should make this inductor as small as possible to make it as sensitive as possible to uh, currents, right? To the individual photons. So there are some tricks with superconductivity, but the basic takeaway message is that you uh, take two superconductors, you put an atomically thin insulator between them, okay? This object is called a Josephson junction. You might think it would be a capacitor. It turns out to be more of an inductor, okay? But the interesting fact is that this gives you an inductance that depends upon the current, okay? And it depends upon the current so strongly that we can have a situation where the first photon that I put into this circuit where I shunted this uh, Josephson junction with a capacitor, that first photon has a frequency of 4.5 gigahertz. But if I put a second photon in there, it has a frequency of 4.2 gigahertz, okay? So this, if you think about it, is like 300 megahertz worth of attractive interaction between your photons. But the important thing for our uh, purposes is that it's quite different, okay? Mostly we're gonna be able to pretend that that number is infinity, okay? Um, so, uh, I would call this, for the experts, a Hubbard U of negative 300 megahertz, okay? And then you ask, well, we want to have a lattice. We didn't want just one site, right? We wanted our electron to be able to hop around from one atom to the next in the solid. We need our photon to be able to hop around from one lattice site to the next. So it turns out capacitively coupling two of these things does that. I should mention, incidentally, this object is called a transmon qubit, okay? Usually they have a couple more, or at least one more Josephson junction, but qualitatively, this is what's called a transmon qubit, and it's what people use uh, in circuit QED to make quantum computers. And now we can also make some sense of why people call it circuit quantum electrodynamics. Literally, I've drawn a circuit, right? I want to couple two of them together, I just put a capacitor between them. Right? But for us, instead of trying to make quantum computers here, what we're trying to do is make quantum materials where the, you know, our photons are going to be able to hop from one of these circuits or one of these transmons to another. Okay? By changing the value of that capacitor, we can set how fast the photons hop from one site to another. So we've set that number to be about 10 megahertz. And remember, you should compare that to the 300 megahertz of interaction energy. And so that means that if both sites are empty, the photon will hop back and forth between the two sites at a frequency of 10 megahertz. But if one of them has a photon in it, and I try to have the other one hop over, it can't because it has 300 megahertz uh, too much energy, which is bigger than that 10 megahertz flopping frequency, so it can't hop across. Okay? So you might then ask, well, what are the important parameters here? Well, it's those two that I just gave you. Plus, how long do the photons live in the system, which can be in the neighborhood of like 40 microseconds. And so what you can then see is that U times T1 gives me about 12,000 collisions without even taking advantage of the extra two pi factor there. Um, and J times T1 gives me, uh, gives me about 400 lattice sites of tunneling. And so you should think of my photons as being able to hop around in this lattice about 400 sites and collide with one another before they just sort of get absorbed by some resistance and disappear, okay? And this is then enough to, uh, to do some cool many-body physics. So this is what our object looks like in practice. Um, uh, I should say, this is a close collaboration with Dave Schuster's group. Uh, I bite my fingernails. So um, I was actually just telling the quantum optics class this, so I don't do any fat. Um, because uh, there are dangerous chemicals in there. I went into AMO because uh, we have lasers, but you know, no chemicals. Um, but so, so this is a close collaboration with this group, all of the, the, the uh, superconducting 
circuits are built into the space. So um, what you can see is each of these plus signs is one of our cubics, one of our lattice sites. The uh, tunneling just comes from the, the spacing between them, providing some capacitance. Okay. Um, and then these resonators here uh, provide the ability to read out the occupancy of each uh, transmon qubit based on one of these tie shifts, like Anieto was talking about earlier, except it's a photon number dependent shift of this resonator instead of an onon number, number shift uh, that she was talking about earlier. So, so this is the, the, uh, the basic story here. Um, so the question is, great, we've got a system where our particles can hop around. Um, if two of them are on the same site, they attract each other. So that means if they're on different sites, they can't hop on top of each other. How do we build interesting many body states in this system? The particles should be able to become entangled. They can hop, go like 400 lattice sites. They can delocalize before anything in the environment measures the system. How do we start to build interesting states here? Um, and it's not so obvious, I have to say. And in some sense, this is one of the real challenges in quantum science, right? Like uh, you've got a highly coherent system. How do you build up entanglement? You can't put entanglement in by coupling it to the outside world directly because the outside world is pretty classical. So we have to come up with sort of interesting techniques for doing this. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm going to show you kind of two different ways to do it. One by using a special kind of energy dependent damping and the other by harnessing disorder. Okay. Uh, so you might say, how does disorder help me to prepare many body states? How does damping help me to prepare many body states? Those are the two big questions that I would say are left to answer uh, in this piece of the talk. So uh, let's hop on in here. What I would like to do is suggest that we should couple our system to a device that whenever it is empty, refills itself with one photon, okay? And if it ever has two photons, it gets rid of one of the two. Imagine we could make such a device, okay? And then I'm gonna couple that device to the system. And I'm gonna make sure it has the right energy that that one photon can tunnel into the lattice only if the site that it's tunneling into is empty, okay? And that's just setting the, the relative energies of these photons. So what happens if I do this? Well, the idea is that that first photon can hop in and then this thing refills itself. And then nothing more can happen here because this site is full, uh, this site is full, and this so that photon can't hop on top of the other one because of this interaction between them, that inharmonicity, nonlinearity I was telling you about. Nothing can happen until this photon hops over. But once it hops over, this one can hop in and this refills itself, right? Um, so the, the idea is that this makes what's called a mon insulator. It's an insulator where the insulation comes not from the fact that you have two electrons per site and, and poly exclusion prevents you from putting a third, right? But from the repulsion, or in our case, attraction, but it turns out for our purposes, they're the same. Uh, the interaction between the particles prevents any more, uh, any more motion, okay? So uh, this is the idea. The question is, how do we realize this magical object? Okay, now to be clear, there's something quite weird about this object. If you try to write a Hamiltonian for that object, you will fail. Why will you fail? Well, because I told you if this object has zero photons, it'll make itself have one. If it has two, it'll make itself have one. If it has one, it'll also make itself have one, right? So. That's not unitary dynamics, right? If it were unitary, it would take one back to zero and two, right? As soon as you add some irreversibility to your system, right, uh, you need to add some damping. But remember, what we said was damping is our enemy, right? Because it takes particles out of the system, it destroys quantum coherence, et cetera. So the question is, how can we make 
this kind of irreversible object uh, for our model here. Uh, and uh, that's what I want to tell you. So there's a, for, let me just point out, there's a whole set of literature people talking about in theory what these things will allow, okay? I just want to talk to you about how to make that. Because as I said, we already know how to make this, right? How do we make that bad boy? Um, so what we wanted was an object that if it ever has zero photons, goes to one. So you might say shine a laser on it, right? That's resonant with the zero to one transition. But that's not going to work. Because if you shine a laser on it that takes it from zero to one, that laser then exactly takes it back from one to zero, right? That's what Rabi oscillations are. That's not what we wanted. We wanted an object that takes it from zero to one, but not one to zero. So how do we achieve that? Well, what I would like to argue we should do is take some inspiration from the way a laser works. We want to generate an inversion in this one state, okay? And the way you generate an inversion is you drive from zero to two somehow, and you make sure that the two state decays much, much faster than the one state. So as soon as you're up in the two state, you decay down to the one state, right? But the one state is long lived. So you stay there as, as long as you can, okay? So then the question is, how do we make the two state decay really fast? The state with two photons in this transmon qubit. How do we make that decay fast? What we would really like to do is couple the transmon to some object that very efficiently absorbs photons of that energy, but not photons of this energy. Yeah? So that is an RLC circuit tuned to be resonant with the two to one transition. Okay, and so then the picture you should have in mind, and now you can see again why this is circuit quantum electrodynamics. I've literally drawn a circuit here, and we're combining quantum mechanical stories about individual photons in this thing with very classical stories about building RLC circuits to damp out photons and only certain energies. Okay? Um, and... Uh, Incidentally, it's very important that this resistor be cold. Why? Well, because if that resistor isn't cold, it will be continuously repopulating this RLC circuit with photons at the right energy to excite us from one to two, right? That's bad. Right? Because that takes us out of this state that we want it to be in. What we really need is for it to be cold enough that it damps us by putting this energy into some reservoir of modes, presumably part of our dilution refrigerator, and the dilution refrigerator then takes that entropy for us. Okay? And again, you can think of the irreversibility of this story as coming about because if you could somehow look at all of the phonon modes of that resistor, right, by, by measuring the occupation of all those phonon modes, whenever this thing refilled itself and went back to this one state, you would see one additional photon or phonon in those phonon modes. Okay. So these are the ingredients. We know how to make all of the pieces. Uh, let's look at what happens when we actually uh, run this thing forward in time. So what I'm going to show you is the occupation of each of the sites in the lattice versus time, starting at time zero when we turn the thing off. Okay? And what you see is that it starts out empty, and then you get this uh, filling front as photons load into the system one by one, and this makes us a mod insulator of photons. Okay? Um, and in fact, this speed limit is set by what's called a Lee Robbins effect. Okay, uh, but then there's an interesting thing we can do here, which is we can say, what would happen if I just got rid of one of the holes and one of the particles in the system? This thing should refill it. It's kind of like a chemical potential, okay? Um, and uh, if we don't have this refilling device on, then when I run it, I just get a random walk 
of this hole through my system, a quantum random walk. If I turn that, uh, that reservoir on, the hole makes it to the reservoir and gets eaten. Okay, and so in some sense, you can think of this device as kind of like a chemical potential for light. Okay, and so if you uh, if you're anything like me, prior to doing this, I had never thought about microscopically how a chemical potential works, right? Or really how a system thermalizes by exploring accessible quantum states at a given energy. But this gives you an opportunity to sort of ask uh, those kinds of questions. Okay, um, so we prepared what I would call an insulator, one particle per site, okay? Now, for those of you who are more cynical, you might say, John, well, that, that insulator is pretty classical, right? It's one particle per site. I can do that with marbles. And to you, I say, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> um, but, but no, I would say there, there are more exotic uh, states that are incompressible. And this, this kind of preparation scheme requires incompressibility. That is to say, it's free to put photons in right up until you get to a point where there's a huge gap and then you can't put any more in, right? That's what we require for this. It turns out Laughlin states also have that property, right? So we could use this technique to prepare Laughlin states and indeed we intend to in the future, right? But in the interim, this state is more or less the most expensive uh, Moncala board you've ever seen, <laughs> right? Uh, if, and in Moncala, you can have more than one marble per site, which is kind of fun too. Um, <laughs> So then you might ask, can we build on this to prepare uh, states where the photons interact with each other strongly, but still manage to delocalize a little bit, okay? Uh, and, and the answer is yes, we can. We can use the same platform, but we can't use the dissipative stabilization ideas. We can't use this chemical potential. So what tools do we have at our disposal here? Well, we can drive high pulses to put particles into individual lattice sites if we want to. We can tune the energy of the individual lattice sites. That is to say, we can move the required energy to put a particle into site one up and move the energy to put a particle into site two down and so forth, okay? Um, and then we can detect at the end which sites have particles and so forth. So these are the tools that we have. Can we use this to make a strongly correlated fluid? Uh, uh, and the answer is yes. And let me show you how that works. Um, so imagine I start by putting in a bunch of disorder. Okay. So the idea here is uh, if we just look at this left side for a moment, I have the sites at very different energies. The energies are so different that my photons can't tunnel around. And now you can just write down what the eigenstates of this system are because the particles can't be localized, right? Uh, I've drawn it as the highest energy eigenstate because our tunneling is negative, but anyway, don't worry too much about that. Um, the highest energy eigenstate is a particle localized on that site. Does that make sense to everybody? The way you can tell that is that this site is the, the most in that direction. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you might say, well, it should be able to hop to the other sites and delocalize and then symmetric or anti-symmetric pairs would be uh, higher or lower energy. But I've created a situation where all of the eigenstates are localized. Okay, and that's the key to disorder. Once the disorder is larger than the sort of hopping energy scales, all of your eigenstates localize. And you can just write down the single particle eigenstates like marbles, the many body eigenstates also look like marbles in in some, uh, in, 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 in a, in a Moncala thing. So you said, I thought you told me this was gonna be quantum mechanical and not classical. Well, the cool thing is we've created an initial situation where to prepare the states and to pick which state we wanna prepare, we can do it very classically by introducing a ton of disorder, right? And then if we can adiabatically remove that disorder, it will melt this localized particle into the highest energy eigenstate without the disorder. And if we started in this second eigenstate, second highest energy, when we melt, we'll go into the second highest energy eigenstate without disorder. 
So far, so good. Okay. So let's do that experimentally. We're going to start with a particle in this highest energy eigenstate, and then we're going to adiabatically bring all the sites to resonance. And so what you see, this is data, is that the particle starts localized here. As we bring the sites to resonance, we end up with that lowest quasi-momentum eigenstate measured in real space in the system. Okay, what if we start in the second highest energy eigenstate? Again, we can melt into the second lowest quasi-momentum state when we remove the disorder. So far, so good. The neat thing, okay, well, actually, the last thing to say here is, how slowly do I have to do this? Well, uh, there's this adiabatic theorem in quantum mechanics that says that if I go too fast through here, I'll put myself into other eigenstates. So for example, if I had started in that one site and I just instantly snapped all the sites to resonance, I wouldn't be in an eigenstate afterwards, right? I'd be in that lattice site and then the particle would kind of bounce back and forth around them. That would be bad, that's not what we want. So to see if we're going slowly enough, what we do is we start in this eigenstate we ramp to degeneracy on some time scale and then we ramp back. Okay. And then at the end, we measure the probability that we that we that we end up in the state we started in. Okay. And if we went too fast, then we'll go into different eigenstates and all of the probability won't go back into that initial site. And so this is that probability of going back into that initial site versus ramp time. So if the ramp takes place in one nanosecond, this site was the highest energy, we go boop, boop. Perfect, right? Except not really. What really happened there was there was not time for any dynamics. Nobody could move around, right? So we go back to where we started. If we go a little bit slower, what we see is that we stop pretty quickly putting much population into that site at all because we're non-adiabatic. We're putting population into other eigenstates. And then if we go really, really slowly, we put the population back into that eigenstate. And this is really powerful as a technique because it localizes all of our information in a basis where classical measurements at the end of the day extract all about what's going on, right? The thing that's hard, if you have to do tomography on your state to see if you made the state that you want, that's really painful. You have to make correlation measurements between lots of lattice sites. What we're doing here is sort of funneling all of our quantum information into as few bits as possible so that we can just measure them, okay? So great, this works beautifully for one photon, but then we can also do it. We can put two photons into the two highest energy states, remove the disorder, and see that we make the, that eigenstate. We can put three photons into the three highest energy states and melt it. And see that we make that eigenstate. We can put four photons into the four highest energy states, right? This, uh, and this all works more or less the way it's supposed to. What I'm comparing to here is uh, exact theory of what those eigenstates are from sort of a Tonks Girardot model to show that we are actually doing uh, what we intend to be doing here. Uh, and in fact, we can even look at correlations between pairs of photons and see that they avoid each other in real space. Um, and when you renormalize this sort of probability of measuring photons at some separation versus that separation, when you normalize it by the density of the gas, you get this universal behavior uh, predicted by Thompson Girardot. Okay. Um, and indeed, we can even, uh, yes. Sorry, when you start with the highest energy site and then you melt it, why do you get the lowest energy quasi momentum? So we have to be careful. Um, we get the lowest quasi momentum, but we do get the highest energy state. Part of the game is that our tunneling is negative, right? So everything is inverted for us highest energies versus lowest energies. Again, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't matter, right? In the solid state, it would be bad 
because you're thermalizing with a reservoir. So if you can lower your energy by putting particles on top of each other, you'll get rid of that energy into your reservoir and all of your particles will collapse on top of one another. In a quantum system, there's nowhere for that energy to go, right? We're not really thermalizing with a reservoir. And so, you know, states that are very different in energy, whether it's positive or negative, are forbidden. Sign doesn't matter, okay? Um, so I don't want to talk too much about this slide, except to say that we want to measure that the photons are really delocalizing here. And we do this by measuring the purity of the single site density matrices, right? Um, and what we see is that uh, in this uh, superfluid phase, that purity goes way down, which says that the sites are entangled with one another. Okay, you could also say the purity goes down because we're getting entangled with the environment, and you would not be wrong to posit that as a possibility. But what we do is we reverse the process and measure the purity, and we see that we recover a high purity, which says we weren't getting entangled with the environment because then it wouldn't have reversed. So it really is entanglement between the sides, this kind of delocalization. Okay, so the, uh, the last piece of this story. Uh, is uh, about preparing superpositions of these few body states. So what have we talked about so far? We've said, I put this first photon in with a pi pulse, right? And I started in this state, I melt into that delocalized state. I put a second photon in with a pi pulse. I started in that state, I melt into that delocalized state. Third photon in with a pi pulse. I start here, I melt into the delocalized state. But what if instead I replace that last pi pulse with a pi over two pulse? So I go into a superposition of having prepared two particles in the lattice and having prepared three, and then I melt, and then I've made a superposition of two different fluids, one with two photons and one with three photons. And indeed, you see here, great, you know, this is, the average of the density of having one here and having zero there, great. This is the average of the two densities. Wonderful, John. Uh, but is there any coherence between those two objects? So what I just showed you is say, drive this pi over two pulse and then tune to degeneracy and then measure. But you can do something pretty cool. You can drive this pi over two pulse. You can tune to degeneracy. You can wait some amount of time and that accrues space between the two particle state and the three particle state set by their energy difference, right? And then I can tune back, okay? And, that, and then I can drive another pi over two pulse on whatever that qubit was. And the point is that all of that many body phase information should be encoded in this Ramsey experiment on that single qubit, okay? And so indeed we do this and we see Ramsey fringes, right? Superpositions of these many body states. Uh, and you can now look at that same data. Remember I showed you adiabaticity data earlier, where if you ramp too fast, you make the wrong many body states. So what I'm showing you here is the frequencies that we generate, right? In that Ramsey fringe as a function of, uh, how long the ramp takes. So the other way to look at this data is each one of these fringes is versus the hold time at zero disorder. And this is for different amounts of time spent ramping and ramping back, okay? And what you can see is once the ramp gets long enough, all of the information concentrates in one Ramsey frequency. Right, which says we're making a superposition of just two many body states. Okay, and so we can do this for a superposition of zero and one photons, one and two photons, two and three photons. Right, all works exactly as we expect. So the question is can we use this same tool instead of doing superpositions of the number of particles in the system? Can we do a superposition of system sizes? So that seems weird because I'm pi pulsing particles in. How can that control the system size? It may not be clear to you, but this data is preliminary. 
Um, so, so let's draw how we're going to do, do that superposition. The basic idea is to take the last site in the lattice and detune it by the interaction energy, okay, by U. So what does that mean? That means if there is no particle in this site, then I have a five-site system, right? If there is a particle in this site, then I have a six-site system because this photon can hop in there, right? Now, for the smart Alex in the audience, the tunneling will be too large by a factor of root two. There's a Bose enhancement on that tunnel. But we've got this really cool trick where what we do is shake this lattice site up and down at a very high frequency that puts sidebands on it somewhere crazy, but reduces the spectral weight at this energy. This is what's called floquet engineering. And we can use that to reduce that tunneling make distance. Okay? Uh, and it turns out the difference in energy between a state in five sites and that same state in six sites is the compressibility of the system, right? How much energy did it cost you to compress it by one lattice set? Um, and so let's, uh, let's just take a look at that. And again, uh, it's great. As a PI, I can say this works like magic. I was looking at, on the Slack and they've been working on this data for like three or four months. But from my perspective, it all just works very easy. Um, <laughs> So you all have that to look forward to. Uh, ungrateful PIs. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm showing here is versus this modulation strength. Um, which, so again, I say this data is pretty preliminary, but the point is that at precisely this modulation strength, the, uh, the tunneling has been reduced from root two J down to J. Uh, and uh, we can see these, uh, these Ramsey features. And indeed, you can see the energy difference uh, for two particles for five versus six sites isn't so different than for one particle for five versus six sites. And that's because the density is fairly low, right? And so the interactions between the particles don't play a huge role. What we intend to do is look at this as we make the system either smaller and smaller or put more and more particles into that lattice. And that should then be a way to, uh, to see that the system becomes less and less compressible. Right, uh, the higher the density is. Okay, um, so where does this leave us? Well, this last little bit I was telling you about is more or less about this idea of combining sort of NISC error quantum computers, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. That is to say, no error correction in the quantum computer, right? But we have a, a, a device on which we can apply gate operations, pi over two pulses, pi pulses, Ramsey experiments, combining that with synthetic matter, right? Synthetic quantum matter. And my point is that I think there's a lot of really beautiful physics that's going to come from those kinds of ideas uh, in the short to intermediate term. Maybe even more beautiful than what I already should. <laughs> I'm known for being humble. Um, so, uh, here's what I'll say. I don't want to go in detail through this last story because I want to leave us with the full 10 minutes for questions. But let me just say that the last piece here uh, is about this idea that converting between optical photons and microwave photons, optical photons and millimeter wave photons, uh, it speaks to another really important axis in quantum science, which is that optical photons are great for communication, right? You send them down fibers, there's very little black body, wonderful. Not so great for quantum computing, right? Microwave photons are great for quantum computing. So at a frontier in quantum science is sort of hybrid quantum devices that use different types of information carriers, qubits, mm -hmm. Uh, et cetera, for different pieces of the process. Um, but then you need something that can convert back and forth between those different uh, frequency domains. So what we've done is uh, built a device which is far too large to possibly be useful, but that can transduce sort of as a proof of concept with high fidelity, 
optical and millimeter wave single photons with noise less than one photon um, and bandwidth of several hundred kilohertz. And qualitatively speaking, the way this device works is we have Rydberg atoms sitting here. Those Rydberg atoms can absorb millimeter wave photons living in a millimeter wave cavity. Why do we have a cavity? Well, because the absorption cross section of these Rydberg atoms is fairly small. So you need a lot of time to perform that absorption to be successful. So the superconducting cavity gives you that. Okay, once the atom has, a, one of those atoms has absorbed that photon, um, then we can de-excite the atom to this low-lying state where it can emit into an optical cavity. Okay, uh, and then we need one more laser to take the atom back to, uh, to where it started uh, so that there isn't information stored in the atoms. Okay, and so the upshot is uh, this works like magic. Uh, again, as from the perspective of a PI, it's magic. The students only worked on it for 10 years. <laughs> um, more than one generation of students. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this, this works really wonderfully. You have to develop new types of cavities. You have to develop new skills for manipulating Rydberg atoms. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, quite an exciting, fun new platform. So with that, Thank you guys for your attention. I guess I'm both the speaker and the moderator. So. Uh, I actually have a two part question. So in your first part, the uh, first part of the talk, you were talking about random levels of photons. Uh -huh. And one of the characteristics of random levels is you have a High number, like high degeneracy. So, what am I supposed to understand as the degeneracy in this photonic? Uh, it's different level? spatial modes of the cavity. So, so it's not a number of photons. No, it's a. That's what I'm saying. We're used to thinking about cavities in this Spock basis, right? The thing that's degenerate, and 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 the picture there is that the kinetic energy degree of freedom is a real spatial degree of freedom of the photon. Right? This is not a synthetic dimension, it's a real dimension, right? So the photons can be in a mode which looks like a blob, and then they can be in modes of rings of different sizes. So, uh, are you a theorist? No. Okay, do you know about uh, the symmetric gauge uh, functions of the lowest Lando level? They're rings, okay? And so this cavity's eigenmodes, when they're not quite degenerate, are the same as the eigenmodes in the symmetric gauge, which are these rings. Of course, once you go to degeneracy, I can't tell you what the eigenmodes are. I can only tell you what the space is that they span. But they are the, it's the symmetric gauge eigenfunction, real space, just like you would expect. Okay? And the second part of the question is, it's overarching between the first and second half of the talk, which is, uh, you, you talked about Laughlin states, uh, Making Laughlin states both in photonic Lorna levels and this uh, mm -hmm. trans mon simulator. Uh, now, real electrons uh, also have statistics. It's the wave function acquires a minus sign when you exchange two things. So, what is uh, causing? Yes, so this is a great question. Our particles are bosons. Uh, we are used to thinking about this physics for fermions. So the interesting thing is that the, the feature, the fundamental features of the Laughlin state do not depend at a fundamental level on the statistics of the particles. Now, you would say, at what filling fraction do I have a Laughlin state? That's different for bosons and fermions. So for the experts in the audience, the fermionic Laughlin states live at odd denominator filling fractions. The bosonic Laughlin states live at even denominators. And so you can write out this Laughlin wave function uh, just as our, uh, our, our, our big boss, uh, up, is he upstairs? That's, uh, our big boss that way wrote them down, <laughs> except that the exponents are even instead of odd. Right, and I'm being very careful not to say that we are studying the quantum Hall effect, right? The Hall effect is a feature of transport, 
And there the statistics, at least for integer halves, matter a lot. It's not clear to me how much they matter for, for fractional hall edge transport. That's an interesting question. This is Laughlin physics, not Hall physics. Uh, let's get somebody from the back and we can move back and forth. Oh, yeah. So like early in the talk, you're showing the device and you talked about how the like just physical proximity of the different lattice creates that capacitance interaction. Uh -huh. um, you know, presumably then there's like an interaction between like site n and, and like n plus two, right? Not just like adjacency. Well, that's a mean question. Does it? <laughs> no, that's a, it's a great question. So does that, how, I, so I guess the question then is how um, big is that? So that like, I guess the interaction like J2 or something, is that, is that something you've seen in your, the relevancy of that um, interaction, has that appeared in your experiments and what effects would that have? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Let's start with part two and then go back to part one. So generically, you can look at the band structure of a periodic type binding lattice with non nearest neighbor hopping. Okay. And it turns out that with nearest neighbor hopping, you get only a term that looks like cosine Q. Right. With second nearest neighbor hopping, you get a term that looks like cosine 2Q. With third nearest neighbor hopping, you get a term that looks like cosine 3Q. And literally, the Fourier coefficients of those terms are the strengths of the hopping matrix elements. Isn't that cool? Well, I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so it would, the point is it will affect the band structure, right? But I would say it doesn't sort of fundamentally change the physics. It would mess up our Lee Robinson bound for how fast the things propagate. Now, regarding your other question about how, how large that term is, it's a great question and I don't have a numerical answer for you. But what I can tell you is that we're very close to a ground plane, right? So the scaling is not gonna be linear with distance, right? So, so my, you know, already the ratio is probably 10 or 20 in distances. And then my guess is it's at least quadratic, right? Uh, so it's probably pretty okay. Now, that being said, you're very right to be suspicious about uh, parasitic effects in circuit QED. Okay. And, you know, we build these circuits, we turn, we tune the qubits with flux loops, right? That uh, there's some squid loop in the, in the transmon that we can use to, uh, to, to change its resonant frequency. Okay. And we do that with a little magnetic coil. What you discover is that the crosstalk between different coils is like 50%. It's terrible, okay? Now, there are tricks for dealing with this Add another ground plane directly above. What you discover though, is that currents don't take the shortest path through the ground plane of a superconductor. I didn't know this. This is apparently obvious to people who do circuit QED. They take whatever path they want because they're ballistic. So there's not a sense of like minimizing their resistance. Right, so, so you have to have a separate ground return for each one. The whole thing is a mess, okay? But what that means in practice is that actually most of the time getting to this disorder control result was about controlling that crosstalk both at DC and as a function of frequency, right? You have to measure like almost frequency dependent crosstalk matrices and back it all out to make it behave well. Now, that being said, our device has 50% crosstalk. I happen to know that Oscar Painter's device has like 1% crosstalk, right? And I think the IBM devices have even less. So it's not that you can't solve that problem, we just haven't solved it uh, in the device that I showed you here. Okay? Other questions? I think we can probably do what, one more and then... Uh, Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> so, for the experiments, you may have up and down the disorder. Uh, what does that knob look like? What does the knob look like? Yeah. You, you wish it was a knob. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the, way the, thing, the way these experiments are controlled in practice is by a ton of arbitrary waveform generators. Okay? And so, we have an arbitrary waveform generator 
that controls the current that flows through each of the flux loops for, for, for each transmog, right? And so the point is you program a sequence that tunes those flux, tunes the disorder from large to small, but the, the software has to know internally how much crosstalk there is and invert that frequency dependent cross coupling matrix and feed the right signals to each of the transmogs. Now, that sounds terrible, but let me just point out that that's single particle physics to find that frequency dependent crosstalk matrix. And unlike a cold atom experiment, that if you're lucky runs a couple cycles per second, and if you're unlucky runs, you know, one minute per cycle, circuit QED experiments run at like a kilohertz to a megahertz in terms of rep rate. Right, so, so making these measurements is not so terrible. In fact, in practice, the thing that limits how fast we can run experiments is that our photons live in the samples for too goddamn long, right? And so one of the new frontiers in these kinds of experiments is what we call active reset, which is at the end of the experiment, you do another experiment where you measure the occupation of each lattice site and then do active feedback to remove photons from sites that have photons. Okay, so I'll stick around for a couple minutes. Thank you guys very much for coming.